Hello, this is Hayden Scott, EMS Program Manager for EMS University of San Antonio. We're now going to look at Lesson 5-2, Soft Tissue Injuries. Here you see a diagram uh, describing in a little bit of detail um, RICER. This is going to be an important acronym for you to remember, especially when dealing with soft tissue injuries. Um, rest, stay off of it as much as possible. Um, ice, uh, 20 minutes every two hours as needed for uh, uh, any discomfort or swelling. Um, usually you want to do it pretty consistently within uh, the first 72 hours of a soft tissue injury. Compression, wrap it. Don't wrap it too tight though. You always have to be careful to allow for uh, any additional swelling. Um, elevation, uh, this will help reduce swelling as well. And referral, um, if necessary, to the patient's primary provider or um, the ER. Closed injuries. Um, these are injuries that do not penetrate the skin. The extent of the damage may not be readily visible. Um, usually you can't tell um, any definitive injuries um, without some sort of radiology. Um, however, any kind of uh, hematoma or contusion or um, even redness or just flat swelling to the area um, will be the biggest indicator in the field um, as to what you're dealing with. Um, but it's important to know the body systems locations so that you can better judge the effective systems without um, visually inspecting the injury. Open injuries, um, open soft tissue injuries uh, are injuries where the surface of the skin or the mucous membrane are broken, uh, exposing the underlying deeper tissue. Here you see um, what appears to be a degloving injury. Uh, you can see the muscle tissue uh, underneath uh, where the skin used to be. We're now going to discuss burn injuries. Uh, potential complications with any burn injuries are uh, hypothermia, hypovolemia, uh, which is uh, loss of fluids, and infection. An important step in management is to determine the depth and extent of damage to determine where and how the patient should be treated. Your types of burn injuries are going to be thermal, chemical, electrical. These uh, uh, a subcategory to electrical are lightning uh, injuries. And then you have radiation. Um, we're going to look at depth classifications. Um, the first degree, superficial, most everybody's had one. Uh, red, painful, this is your sunburn. Uh, these are what most sunburns fall under. Uh, your second degree burns or partial thickness. Uh, these have blister formations. They're very painful. They're actually um, the most painful burn uh, simply because uh, they're much closer to the, uh, the nerve endings. The third degree is a full thickness. Um, these are painless because the nerve endings are actually burned. So they're non-existent. You're not going to feel any pain. Um, the worst of the pain is going to be on the edges where um, you, you have that partial thickness burn. You're going to see the SR formation, um, going to look black or waxy. Um, then we're going to have the fourth degree burns. Um, these involve bone destruction. Um, these burns you're not typically going to see in the field. Um, they generally uh, only happen with extremely high temperatures um, so if if you see a fourth degree it's it's gonna be you're gonna know that it's an extremely high temperature uh, involved in the burn uh, here are so, uh, some pictures um, you see over here on the left um, the superficial the redness you can see the demarcation where um, the patient's skin was not exposed but you see the darkening to the skin here uh, these first degree burns can be very painful um, but they're 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 not really that um, big of an issue the worst of it is going to be uh, issues with temperature regulation here on the right we see the second degree burn the, or the partial thickness you see the where the blister had formed and ruptured um, 
exposing this uh, much more sensitive tissue underneath. Uh, you can see where the blister, um, where the upper layer of skin is still uh, intact, but you can tell that where it was raised because of a blister. You always want to be sure uh, this this area of skin here. You want to try not to leave it exposed. Uh, you want to leave blisters intact if at all possible. Um, simply, once you rupture this, you open this uh, bottom layer of skin open to uh, infection. So uh, be very careful with these uh, because this is your uh, the, your patient's uh, first line of defense against. Uh, any microorganisms or bacteria ha has now been uh, compromised so you got to be very careful um, about watching for infection. Uh, third degree burn is a full thickness burn. Note the swelling in this underlying soft tissue here um, simply because it's just uh, there's there's nothing left. The body is trying to send uh, that that uh, inflammatory response to fight any infection or any bacteria that are uh, trying to enter in the body through this. Um, these are very very critical burns. Um, notice the skin is sloughing uh, off. Uh, just keep in mind this patient really isn't in much pain. Um, simply because because their nerve endings are are fried. There's nothing left. Often it is not possible to predict the exact depth of a burn. Uh, in the acute phase. Uh, however, when in doubt, uh, feel free to call it the next worst degree. Uh, simply, uh, better be safe than sorry. You don't want to undermine that, uh, you know, and call a third degree, a second degree burn, and uh, potentially uh, open that patient up for uh, more issues. So always treat the next degree higher um, if that's what you suspect. Um, j just for the patient's safety, um, it's always better to err on the side of caution. Now we're going to look at the BSA or body surface area estimation. Um, we generally in the field tend to use the rule of nines. Um, this is where the body surface is divided into areas representing 9% uh, or multiples of 9. Uh, you see the head is 9%, each arm is 9%, the anterior of the trunk is 18 percent. The posterior of the trunk is another 18 percent. Um, and then each leg is 18 percent. And then of course you see the 1 percent for the groin. Um, however, the groin is also um, uh, one of the more critical areas if there's a burn involved. You can also use the palm rule, uh, the where the patient's palm represents 1% of his or her body surface. Um, either one of these is acceptable. Um, one is not more correct than the other. Um, however, with the rule of nines, you have to keep uh, in mind the difference between adult and child, and we'll go over the child in just a moment. Uh, here we see the pediatric. Um, for each year, uh, over one year old, subtract 1% from the head and add equally to the legs. Um, so, you know, you see the 18% for the, the pediatrics head simply because their head is so much larger than um, their body. So, uh, you know, anything under a year old, uh, it's going to be 18%. And then every year after that, you'll. Um, as I stated earlier, subtract a, um, a percentage, 1% uh, and uh, add, e uh, distribute evenly between the legs. Um, otherwise, not much has changed except for obviously the legs are um, lower uh, percentages because it, it all got moved up to the head. Um, the palm rule also applies, uh, but again, it's 1% of his or her body. Um, the rule of nines for infants includes the head as 18% of the total body surface area. Again, um, this is very important to remember simply because, um, you know, uh, their head's so much larger um, than their body proportionally. Uh, burn severity factors, there, there are many. Um, the depth or classification, um, 
you know, the first degree, second degree, third degree, and so on. Uh, the BSA that's burned. Also, one of the biggest factors is age. Uh, adult versus pediatric, obviously the pediatrics are not going to tolerate as well. Um, same for your geriatric patients. Anybody over, say, the age of 60, they're not going to tolerate um, these burns well. They already have issues uh, temperature with temperature regulation, so uh, any burn is going to make it that much worse. Pre-existing medical conditions are going to um, obviously play, play a, a pretty important role. Um, we're also going to look at the associated trauma. Uh, is it a blast injury, fall? Is there a fall associated? Um, is there any airway compromise? If you notice any singeing around the um, nose or lips, um, you can pretty well bet, or even the um, mucous membrane in the mouth, uh, you can pretty well bet that they inhaled some flames and could have potentially um, done some damage to the airway so that's something to look for uh, also child abuse uh, are they round little burns on the on the child you know any is is it indicative of perhaps a uh, cigarette burn uh, these things you always have to keep in mind you, you always have to be aware of special considerations your patient's age again um, less than two or greater than 55, um, they have an increased incidence of complication. Um, like I said, they already have issues with thermoregulation, so uh, burns are just going to complicate this so much more. The burn configuration. Um, circumferential burns can cause total occlusion of circulation to an area due to edema um, or compartment syndrome. Uh, the compartment syndrome could cause pretty severe issues. Um, so you, you need to be aware of that, um, be on the lookout for that. Restrict ventilation if, um, it encircles the chest. Um, you don't want to overventilate or hyperventilate your patient, um, too much, simply because you could, um, cause more damage to the tissue by trying to hyperventilate, or by trying to expand that chest wall. Uh, burns on joint area can cause disability due to scar formation. Um, it's just like, um, you know, it, the the damage is not going to be done just to the skin. It's also done to the underlying tissue. And those joints, um, you get scar tissue forming in and around those joints, and it'll really, really restrict the movement. So you also need to be aware of this. Your minor burn criteria uh, for your third degree is less than 2% uh, BSA, or body surface area. For your second degree burns, uh, less than 15% BSA. Um, for your pediatrics, it falls into the less than 10%. Um, and then your first degrees are going to be less than 20% BSA. Your moderate burn criteria for a third degree burn is between 2 and 10%. Your second degrees for adult uh, will fall 15 to 30 percent, uh, 10 to 20 percent for your pediatrics. Um, this does exclude the hands, face, feet, or genitalia. Um, you also want to make sure that there are no other complicating factors, such as age, as we described, or a, a pre existing medical condition. because those will uh, remove your patient from the moderate burn criteria and push them into the critical burn criteria, as we see here. For third degree burns, you're going to have greater than 10% body surface areas. Um, this is what constitutes a crit critical burn. Uh, your second degree burns are going to be greater than 30%, um, greater than 20% on a pediatric. Um, your critical burns are also going to be um, any burns with suspected respiratory injury. Again, when you get that um, singeing of the hair around the nose um, on your male patients, do they have, is their facial hair singed? Um, you know, their mustache, their goatee, their beard. Um, is the hair burned? It, is the mucous membrane in the mouth black? Um, same in the nose. If there's any blackening of that mucous membrane, you can pretty well suspect that they inhaled flame. 
um, and that they have sustained a respiratory injury. Any burn that includes the hand, face, feet, or genitals um, constitute a critical burn. Any circumferential burns. Uh, burns complicated by other trauma. Any underlying health problems and electrical and deep chemical burns. Your treatment is going to be uh, to remove them to the safe to a safe area if possible. Um, however, you also have to remember your safety comes first. You then want to stop the burning process, extinguish the fire, cool the smoldering areas, uh, remove any clothing or jewelry um, if if possible, cut around areas where clothing is stuck to the skin. If the jewelry is stuck to the skin, leave it. Um, you could potentially do more damage um, trying to remove it. Um, you want to cool any adherent substances like tar or plastic. Um, because the longer they stay warm, the more damage they're going to do. Uh, you're going to get a pertinent history. How long ago did this happen? Um, what care has been given between... Um, now and them uh, coming into contact with you. What were they burned with? Were they burned in a closed space? Um, are there products of combustion, combustion present? Um, shrapnel, anything of that nature. How long were they exposed? Uh, was there any loss of consciousness? Um, and of course, as with any injury or illness, always get a medical history. Um, and this doesn't just include illnesses. Um, it also includes surgeries as well. Um, because you never know what can be pertinent until you ask the right question. So it's always safe to maybe ask um, for quite a bit of clarification. Uh, never be afraid to ask. Other considerations, uh, you want to, of course, assess the burn surface area and associated injuries. Um, you probably um, want to go ahead and get advanced life support um, on site for pain management and treatment. Um, you do want to avoid topical agents, uh, except as directed by your local burn sitters, uh, centers. Um, these include agents like silvadine. Um, uh, you should also be aware of your local burn centers. Um, what is your nearest burn center? And what are their protocols? You want to treat the burn wound. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, do not rupture blisters. You want to cover with a sterile dressing. Moisten it, uh, but limit it to small areas. You know, less than 10%. Uh, you want to keep them dry for any area larger than 10% uh, due to the concern for hypothermia. Again, as I stated earlier, they have serious issues with thermoregulation. So you don't want to cover, you know, greater than 10% with moist dressings uh, simply because the second that uh, any ambient air hits it, uh, it's going to immediately cool and could uh, throw your patient into some pretty severe uh hypothermia. Uh, then you want to cover them with a burn sheet. Uh, you want to make sure that you transport your patient to an appropriate facility. Um, uh, is it a burn center or not? Uh, you also want to look at um, the severity criteria. You need to know this for your local burn center. Um, what criteria do they have to meet to be admitted into the burn center? Um, or what criteria do they have to meet to be turned away or to be uh, for your uh, simple level one traumas uh, centers to not be able to really completely handle um, the burn that you're bringing? Uh, your transport resources. Um, if you're 20 minutes away from the nearest uh, burn center, uh, would an air ambulance be more practical? Is it weather permitting? Always be aware of what resources you have at your disposal. Uh, chances are 
you're not going to be the only transport resource available. So uh, always keep an open mind to using uh, your air ambulances. For inhalation burn injuries, ALS. Absolutely no questions asked. This patient needs to have an advanced uh, level provider on board. Simply because you need to anticipate the respiratory problems. Um, head, face, neck, or chest. Nasal or eyebrow hairs or singe. Hoarseness, tachypnea, drooling present, uh, LOC in um, a, a burned area or an actively burning area, uh, nasal or oral mucosa dry or red, um, soot in the mouth or the nose, uh, they'll be coughing up black sputum, and again, they're enclosed in a burning area, um, like a small apartment or an office. Um, you can never be overly prepared for something like this. Chances are if they have any of these signs or symptoms uh, or markers even, uh, they're probably going to end up having a severe respiratory issue that you alone cannot handle. So um, you need to have that a uh, advanced level uh, provider on board simply because they can take the airway management uh, a step above or a couple steps above where you can. Uh, your other considerations for inhalation injury are toxic gas inhalation, uh, smoke inhalation, of course carbon monoxide poisoning as we went over in a previous section, um, and again thermal burns and chemical burns. Uh, your treatment is going to be airway oxygenation and ventilation. Uh, again, assess for airway edema early and often. At the first sign of any uh, fluid on the lungs, y you know, y you need to act pretty quickly. Uh, when in doubt, always oxygenate and ventilate. High flow oxygen should always be used on any suspected inhalation injury. Uh, you may want to uh, consider bronchodilators um, if bronchospasm is present and other criteria are met. This is also going to be up to your local protocol and medical direction. So, again, we cannot stress enough. Always be aware of your local protocol, what, they, what it says. Uh, again, advanced life support. Always, always, always have them on the ready or on the way to meet up with you. Simply because these inhalation injuries could very well uh, turn into something much worse than... Uh, what it seems at the moment. Uh, other considerations, you want to assess for other burns and injuries, of course. Uh, you want to treat your burns to the soft tissues. Uh, treat associated inhalation injuries um, or poisoning. Uh, again, ALS, always have your advanced level provider, um, at least en route to your location. Again, your transport considerations include your burn center, um, it could also, for your inhalation injuries, could also be a hyperbaric chamber, uh, depending on the severity and the um, potential uh, injuries uh, that could uh, to the respiratory system. Your chemical burns are usually associated with industrial exposure. Uh, the first consideration uh, is always, should you be here? Uh, does the patient need decontamination before treatment? Um, do they just need a shower, an eye wash station, or is this something that we you need to call in the hazmat team for? Um, so the, these are always the first thing that should run through your mind the second um, you learn or suspect that chemicals are involved. Um, one thing to remember, burning will continue as long as the chemical is on the skin. So as quickly as you can decontaminate uh, these patients or get that chemical off their skin, uh, the better off your patient's going to be for it. Your acids need immediately coagulation type ne uh, cause immediate coagulation type necrosis, creating an SR, um, though self-limiting the injury. Um, these are literally going to eat through your soft tissues. So um, that's one of the biggest things with acids. You've got to look for the SR, um, and if chemicals are even suspected, you need to um, 
take care of it pretty quick. Your alkalis or your basis cause a liquefactive necrosis, um, meaning it literally liquefies the tissue with continued penetration into deeper tissue resulting in a pretty extensive injury. Um, these are actually a lot more critical than your acid burns are. So either way, um, acid or base, they are severe, they are critical, and they need to be handled pretty quickly. Your management, um, of course, the first thing is to get the chemical off the skin. Your lip, your liquid chemicals can be washed off with copious, copious amounts of fluid. Uh, you do want to avoid chemical antidotes uh, in or around the eyes. Um, if applicable, if the eyes are involved, remove the contact lenses. For your dry chemicals, you want to brush away as much of the chemical as possible and then wash off with large, with large quantities of water. Um, of course, flush 20 to 30 minutes to remove all chemicals. Um, you, you also want to watch the socks and shoes. They uh, track chemicals uh, pretty easily, so um, they need to probably be removed um, just to be on the safe side. Do not attempt to neutralize any chemical. Um, always be sure you check the MSDS or the Material Safety Data Sheet. Um, you could actually cause additional chemical or thermal burns from the heat of neutralization. Um, it is not a passive um, action. It's, it's actually an aggressive action. So um, you could actually intensify your patient's burn by trying to neutralize the agent. Um, you want to assess and deliver secondary care um, as with any other thermal um, and or inhalation burns. Uh, some specific chemical considerations that you may come in contact in the field with um, chemical mace, uh, CN or CS tear gas, um, OC spray which is the um, oleoresin caps, uh, capsicum or your pepper spray these are carried these are both common uh, chemicals carried by most uh, law enforcement agencies uh, simply as a um, neutralizer for any aggressors uh, these cause mucous membrane and respiratory tract irritation um, it also causes uh, skin severe skin sensitization, sorry. Um, for management, you want to treat any respiratory distress. Um, continued irrigation and sour, shower decontamination. Uh, you cannot rinse these people with enough water, I promise you. Um, protect yourself first, though. Always be sure you have the proper um, BSI uh, and PPE um, on yourself before you even get near this patient. Uh, decontaminate everything afterwards. The only allow the only lasting effect for these will be if there's any allergy um, present in the patient. The effects of these will generally wear off about after about 20 minutes with exposure to wind, moving air, and, and or irrigation. Um, however, if they can they remain in an enclosed space, um, the irritation um, will continue on. Now we're going to look at electrical burns. Um, these usually follow accidental contact with exposed uh, object conducting electricity. Um, the biggest offender in this are exposed uh, electrical wires. Um, you always have to be careful with these. Electrical burns can also result from lightning. Um, if this is something that you come in contact with, you really need to consider scene safety. Um, chances are, if your patient got struck with lightning, um, you probably need to get them out of there and get yourself out of there too. Um, if you even make scene, uh, it may be too dangerous. Remember, first and foremost, your safety comes first. Uh, the damage will depend on the intensity of the current. Um, you know, are, are they in a high voltage, have they been in contact with a high voltage power line? Um, or was it simply a plug in the wall? You're going to have two different um, intensities of current in, in these two. 
Um, the severity of the burns will depend on uh, what tissue the current passes through, uh, the width or the extent of the current pathway. Is it an alternating current or a direct current? Um, the duration of the current contact, um, and also the voltage and the amperage. Most damage is done due to heat produced as the current flows through the tissues. The skin burns where the current enters and leaves can almost be trivial looking. Um, you know, you may have a little spot on the palm and the spot on the, on the bottom of the foot. However, everything in between can be absolutely um, cooked, can be literally fried. So just because you see a couple of specks doesn't mean your patient's in the clear. Everything in between um, could be just absolute, uh, for lack of a better analogy, well done. The higher voltage may result in the more obvious external burns. Uh, for your alternating currents, uh, the tetanic muscle contraction may occur resulting in any muscle injury, uh, tendon rupture, jointless dislocation, and fractures. Um, just all of a sudden, uh, spasm is severely traumatic on the body. These spasms may keep the patient from freeing oneself from the current. Um, so you have to be, uh, be on the lookout. Uh, if they look like they're still in contact with it, you know, you see those continued contractions, you really need to steer clear from there. Because um, remember, can't say this enough, your safety comes first. In addition to the contact burns, the patient can also develop flash burns um, when the current arcs near them. Uh, flame burns may occur when clothing ignites after exposure to the electrical current. Contact with electrical current can result in cardiac arrhythmias, uh, apnea, as well as seizures. Um, so all, all electrocutions, no matter what, get transported. Um, it doesn't matter if they're walkie-talkie, alert, and oriented times four with um, great vital signs. They need to be transported because there's probably damage there. 99.9% .9 of the time, there's damage there that you can't see and they can't feel. So, it doesn't matter the circumstances, they get transported, no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, we'll look at radiation exposure now. The waves or particles of energy that are emitted from radioactive sources um, are the cause of these. Uh, you have alpha particle radiation. Uh, these are, the alpha particles are very large, they travel a short distance, um, and they have minimal penetrating ability. Uh, however, they can harm internal organs if they are inhaled, ingested, or absorbed. So, um, it, it's usually pretty good to be aware of what's around you. Uh, your beta particles um, are small, they have more energy, and a little more penetrating ability. These usually enter through damaged skin, ingestion, or inhalation. And by damaged skin, we mean, you know, sunburn skin. Any skin that's been damaged. Um, your gamma ray and your x-ray radiation are the most dangerous penetrating radiation. These may even produce localized skin burns uh, and pretty extensive internal damage. So if you notice the the you know, a very localized burn area, um, and they're having some, you know, respiratory issues, or their vital signs are really not doing well, you may suspect a gamma ray or x-ray uh, radiation exposure. Um, again, these, may, these exposures may result in external injury, contamination, um, an incorporation injury even combined injuries as well. The effects of the injuries are completely dependent on the duration of the exposure, the distance from the source, um, as well as any shielding, which is why anytime you have x-rays they have to put a lead shield over your groin or your um, armpits or your neck um, just because those uh, x-rays can't get through that lead. So you need to um, uh, 
keep in mind if there was any shielding, what was it? These patients are usually at pretty good risk for uh, delayed complications. Your special burn considerations, um, your, for your pediatric patients, their skin is extremely thin. Um, this increases the severity of burning um, as relative to adults. Um, of course, you also have to look at the large surface to volume ratio. Um, simply because uh, severe burns will cause extremely rapid fluid loss in a child. Um, and as we discussed earlier, they have an increased heat loss, which will cause uh, um, a hypothermia to occur. Uh, they already have issues with thermoregulation. This is just going to exacerbate that. In kids, there's a delicate balance between dehydration and overhydration. So you have to... Uh, if the scale tips one direction or the other, it, it could be extremely detrimental to your patient. Um, plus, they have immature immunological responses, uh, so they're more prone to sepsis with burns. Um, but again, you always have to consider, at least in the back of your mind, the possibility of any child abuse. Your geriatric burns, um, they have a decreased uh, myocardial reserve, so um, this is going to make the fluid resuscitation extremely difficult. Um, peripheral vascular disease and diabetes uh, will cause a slow healing. So, um, you know, if you've got a geriatric with burns, you can pretty well bet that it's going to take a good long while for these... Uh, to heal. Um, geriatrics generally tend to have more occurrences of uh, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This increases the complications of any airway injury. Um, so if you suspect an airway injury and your patient has a history of COPD, you can pretty well bet that um, they're in a pretty hot zone. They need to uh, be assessed pretty quickly. Um, and they also have poor immunological response, um, which makes them more susceptible to a sepsis state. We're now going to look at trauma assessment and uh, the management considerations. <sighs> Speed kills. Traumatic injury occurs when the body is exposed to force beyond its tolerance. The energy of a moving object is called kinetic injury and is calculated, uh, as we see here below, uh, the kinetic injury uh, equals mass times velocity squared divided by 2. The law of kin kinetic energy says if you double the weight of a moving object, the force doubles. And if you double the speed, the force quadruples. Um, so you, you always want to keep this in mind um, on any kind of uh, trauma. The amount of kinetic injury or f energy or force that is delivered to a human body dictates the severity of the injury. Uh, significant mechanism of injury, you always want to look for evidence of high energy penetration by a projectile or significant direct or indirect force. For example, um, do you have a bent steering wheel? Is the windshield broken? Uh, what's the damage to the exterior? Is there any intrusion into the passenger compartment? Um, also, the patient may present with what we call Droff syndrome, before it's spelled backwards. Um, are they, when you expose the chest, can you see um, the, the steering wheel, the interior of the steering wheel um, outline? These are things that you have to be aware of. If you see any kind of signs like this, chances are you're Patients uh, had some pretty severe trauma. EMTs are not expected to make an accurate diagnosis in the field. The language that you use in your written report should reflect your impression of the injuries based on the evidence you collect. For example, the mechanism of injury, your patient's chief complaint, and their signs and symptoms. Um, 
this is the difference between assessment and diagnosis. Uh, you can assess and make uh, uh, general impressions uh, based on the evidence, um, but it's always uh, vital that you not attempt to diagnose in the field. Uh, soft tissue injuries involving the joints. Dislocations are serious injuries that require prompt attention. Uh, these are characterized by marked deformity, swelling, pain aggravated by movement, loss of the natural motion, numbness, and impaired circulation to the limb. Assessing uh, CMS function. If you suspect a joint is dislocated, assess distal nerve and vascular function by checking CMS. Circulation, motor, and sensory. If a limb has lost circulation, motor, or sensory function, attempt to reposition the dislocated joint and then reassess CMS and note any changes. Discontinue repositioning, though, if the patient experiences increased pain or if you feel any crepitus during the attempt. Your care for closed injuries, reassure the patient. However, do not give any false reassurances. Check the CMS before and after splinting. Immobilize or splint if indicated. Uh, this will also be uh, uh, dictated by your protocols and medical directions, so uh, treat accordingly. Apply ice or a cold pack. Again, this is where ice comes in. Um, ice, you immobilize or compress. You're going to elevate. Uh, consider uh, calling in an advanced life support unit uh, for pain management simply because if, if you get uh, be it soft tissue or, or fracture or anything like that the pain can get pretty severe especially if there's any swelling uh, that could be leading to a type of compartment syndrome um, it gets pretty painful so if you have them available, you, you really should uh, consider calling in an advanced level provider. Arrange for transport to the appropriate care center. Uh, just keep in mind who, who your trauma centers are. Uh, they'll be the ones that are able to treat uh, these patients more um, effectively. Removal of foreign objects. Um, basic life support providers may remove large, easily removed debris such as glass, splinters, or gravel before bandaging. Um, however, you want to secure large and deeply embedded fragments or projectiles uh, in place with a dressing and bandage. Dressings are used primarily to stop bleeding and bandages are placed over the dressings in order to secure them and prevent further bleeding. The initial dressing that you use to control bleeding should always be sterile. Keep in mind, you don't want to remove a dressing once you've applied it. Um, if you attempt to remove it, it any sort of clot or um, anything like that could be removed with the initial dressing. You just want to um, apply additional dressings if the ble bleeding continues. Um, just keep packing gauze on top of it. You want to wrap your injuries distal to proximal. Um, always start away and move inward towards the body. Uh, of course, you want to check your CMS before and after uh, you do any dressing and bandaging. Occlusive dressings cover open wounds such as an abdominal evisceration or an open chest wound. Uh, you want to be sure to provide an airtight seal and prevent air from entering or leaving the chest cavity. Um, this prevents the loss of moisture in cases of open abdominal evisceration. Um, and remember, there you may very well need to um, release any air uh, that's built up underneath the occlusive dressing. Uh, this is also known as burping the wound. Amputations um, and avulsions may require control of bleeding. Um, however, you want to use direct pressure first. Uh, only use a tourniquet for severe life-threatening bleeding as, um, you know, characterized by hypotension. Uh, however, you need to be aware of what your local protocols state. 
You want to wrap any amputated body parts in a dry, sterile dressing. Place this in, an ampu uh, in uh, a watertight container. You then want to place the watertight container um, in a second container that should be placed on ice. Uh, Ziploc bags are excellent for um, amputated fingers and toes. Um, however, you want a double Ziploc. You don't want to allow uh, any chance for moisture to seep in. This could uh, actually damage the tissue. Do not submerge the amputated part in water or place directly on ice. Again, it'll damage the tissue. Do not use dry ice to cool a severed part. However, ice or chemical cold packs are acceptable. You do not submerge the You want to consider sending the body part ahead um, if there will be a transport delay. Uh, that way the trauma team can prep it. You always want to make sure that the body part makes it there either before or the same time as the patient. Um, this way it'll um the the trauma team can better attempt to reattach it uh for tourniquets um wink wink nudge nudge you may see this again you want to place dressings on the wound and apply direct pressure add dressings if necessary if bleeding persists you want to go right to the tourniquet you want to place the tourniquet proximal to the wound, never distal. This is counterproductive. You want to make sure it's a wide tourniquet, at least one to two inches wide. You want to wrap cling or coban around it a few times. Or wrapping cling or coban around a few times works pretty well as well. However, you want to make sure it's pretty tight. This allows for cutting circulation off without destroying tissue in the process. Uh, then you're going to take a pin, rod, or a similar item to crank down the tourniquet until the bleeding stops. You want to be sure you document the exact time that the tourniquet was placed. This is very important. Under no circumstances do you remove a tourniquet after it's been placed. No circumstances at all should that tourniquet be removed once you place it until you get to the facility that is their call not yours this now concludes lesson 5-2 um, if you have any questions please direct them to your